So my uh, program, my session, Homo Organic Farming. And I've also called this subtitle, Total Eradication of Poverty. Now, if we think in terms of environment, the earth is now heavily polluted in uh, very extreme ways. All various different types of pollution are there and five different degrees of danger have been identified. First, there is the simple physical pollution, such as dust and other relatively earth, uh, inert material. Then we have chemical pollution, uh, which we see in uh, today's modern agriculture. So many chemical poisons are, using, are used in agriculture today. The level three of pollution is radiological. This means radioactive poisons, which persist in the environment for thousands of years. The fourth level is self-replicating pollution. That means genetic modified organisms, uh, which are basically uh, are very, very difficult to clean up because they keep self-replicating. And the fifth level is AI, artificial intelligence, about which we know very little, but it also poses a very great danger to the human race. Many environmental problems which we face worldwide can be traced back to one serious mistake, and that is intensive chemical-based agriculture. It's not at all sustainable. With chemical fertilizers and pesticides, we need to increase the dosage or all the formulas as years go by. More and more inputs are required to produce the same results as before. Farmers spend more on external inputs while their income is dropping. Nutrients are extracted from the soil without replenishing them, thus robbing the soil of its life-sustaining elements. Insects, insects then adapt to chemical poisons and many crops are attacked ferociously. After the Chernobyl nuclear accident in 1986, the insects did not die out. They mutated into new and unknown forms, which are totally resistant to all chemical poisons. Wrong agricultural practices and wholesale destruction of forests have affected the weather patterns. Rains are no longer reliable or regular and cause great destruction now. All rains now are actually acidic. The soil becomes so acidic that in some places nothing will grow. Hybrid seeds no longer yield the excellent results which were achieved in the 1960s and 1970s. A stage comes when nothing grows unless the farmer uses massive doses of fertilizers and pesticides. At this stage, he is ruining his soil, the subsoil and the water resources. The final stage is reached when the farmer plants the seed, waters the field and waits, but nothing happens. Nothing will grow, not even weeds. Land that was once fertile and produced abundant crops has to be abandoned. The soil has been totally destroyed. The cash crop mentality, which was promoted in the 1960s along with the Green Revolution, coupled with extensive use of very costly agrochemical inputs, has seen many farmers borrowing heavily at very high interest rates, hoping to capitalize on abundant harvests. Each year, the promised yields have failed to materialize landing many farmers in a very costly debt spiral. Economic problems be so, become so great that many farmers see no way out other than suicide. When farmers come into financial difficulties, the next thing is the banks are affected, first by the farmers defaulting on their loan repayments. Recovery of the initial capital of the loan becomes problematical and there may be no alternative for the bank but to write off the loan. Farmers who can no longer make a living in agriculture look to the city as an alternative. The noble profession of agriculture further diminishes in status, resulting in fewer children of farmers wanting to continue the work of their fathers. Hence, a large migration is now taking place from the rural areas to the big cities, expanding the slum areas. And we've seen that practically now speaking during this COVID-19 crisis in India. How many migrants are in the big cities now? This puts a very great strain on the city's infrastructure, causing many political and social problems, leading to an increase in poverty and health problems. 
Chemical insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, etc., contain extremely toxic substances, which after being sprayed on plants, enter the food chain. Those poisons contaminate our food supply, causing serious health problems, including cancer. A new threat now has recently emerged, which is associated with the GMOs, genetically engineered species, about which we know very little. These have the potential to further contaminate our already compromised food supply. So, all these factors combined threaten the whole of life on Earth. No modern technology exists which can deal with this multi sided attack. Is there any technology which can provide a solution? We say yes. Which technology? Which technology can take care of soil improvement, water purification, neutralizing toxic elements in the atmosphere, and simultaneously improve the functioning of earthworms and honeybees? The answer lies in the super technology of Vruksha Ayurveda, which is now presented in the modern era as Homa Organic Farming. What is Homa Organic Farming? Homa Organic Farming simply means the application of the principles of homotherapy to organic farming practices. What is homotherapy? Homotherapy, as we were told yesterday, means healing the atmosphere, uh, uh, the soil and the water resources with fire as the medium. Central idea is you heal the atmosphere and the healed atmosphere heals you. Of all the fire practices given in the ancient science of homotherapy, Agnihotra is the basic homa. So, Agnihotra, we saw this uh, just now, we saw it yesterday also. Agnihotra, when we speak Agnihotra, we mean the very, very uh, sp specific form of uh, homa in this copper pyramid shaped vessel using the ingredients of dried cow dung, uh, pure cow's ghee, unbroken, unpolished grains of rice. There's a Sanskrit mantra, simple mantra. And it has to be performed at the exact time of sunrise and sunset each day. Then, when we talk about using Agnihotra in homa farming, first thing is we need to establish a resonance point. This is the first step in homa farming. The resonance technique is a part of homotherapy. Their simple practices are used to heal large areas of diseased land in a short time. A resonant point requires 10 new Agnihotra pyramids charged with mantras to be positioned on the farm in a special configuration by a homotherapy volunteer who is trained to install resonance points. The same human effort is required to heal one acre or 200 acres. One resonance point can treat up to 200 acres at a time. Two simple huts are required, built with inexpensive natural materials found locally. Nobody will live in these huts. They're simply to protect the person performing the Agnihotra fire and, and other fires from the sun, the rain, and to prevent, prevent animals from entering and disturbing the materials. So, we, here we have a picture of the 10 Agnihotra pyramids. All the 10 Agnihotra pyramids are activated at one time with mantras. One pyramid is then buried in the Agnihotra hut. This is the hut where Agnihotra is practiced daily. The other nine pyramids are installed in various locations on the farm. The Agnihotra hut is where Agnihotra is performed daily at sunrise and sunset. It's best to build this hut near the center of the farm if possible. Size should be approximately three meters by four meters and alongside aligned with the east-west axis. Entrance has to be from the west and one will sit down facing east to do the fires. Here's a small diagram showing what the hut looks like, uh, made of actual materials, uh, less costly and readily available. There's a picture of our Agnihotra hut in top of one. Uh, the first resonance pyramid is placed in a hole which has been dug in the east side of the Agnihotra hut. There's uh, me placing that first pyramid 
in that hole is this is our Agni Hotra Hatin Kappa one, which was established in 1999. Uh, and uh, you can see that picture there. That's what it looks like uh, when you place that pyramid in a hole. And the, the pyramid is buried. That means, uh, for, first of all, we check the orientation to the east of the pyramid with a compass. And then uh, the soil is carefully placed in the hole to cover that pyramid, making sure not to disturb the orientation of the pyramid to the east. A column of mud is then built up on top of that buried pyramid to a height of about 18 inches above the ground level of the hut. And on this column of mud, which in this picture you can see is supported by some brick uh, formwork, that uh, column of mud on the top contains the second resonance pyramid, which has been activated with mantra. That's pyramid number two. Then pyramids number three and four, uh, also activated with mantra, these are placed on smaller columns in front of that large column. And these two pyramids are used for, first of all, the one on the left for Agnihotra daily, and the one on the right is used for other occasional homas. So now that means we have four pyramids in that Agnihotra hut. There's a diagram showing what they look like. Uh, I've got to rush through quickly because I've got a lot of things to show you. Uh, but any of this material, I, I can uh, go into more details for people who want more details about this. Then there's a second hut to be uh, built, which is a little larger than the Agnihotra hut. It should be four meters by five meters, roughly. This is called the healing hut or the Om Trambakam hut. And uh, this is where Om Trambakam mantra is uh, chanted daily. Sick people can sit there and they automatically get healed by the home of fire. It's better to construct this hut near the entrance to the farm so that outsiders can come and go without disturbing the privacy of those who live and work on the farm. Om Trambakam Homa should be maintained four hours daily plus 24 hours on full moon and no moon days. That's the recommended uh, maximum limit. Uh, it's not so easy to reach up to those figures, but any amount we find of uh, a, a, a practice of this Om um, Kam Homa daily gives a very, very great uh, boost and a great protection on the Homa farm. There's a diagram of what the Agni Hot, uh, the Om Tom Kam Hut looks like. Two pyramids are there. And there's a picture showing one example with the two pyramids. The one on the left is for Agni Hotra and the one on the right is for the Om Trambakam Mantra. Then we have four pyramids remaining. So these four pyramids are raised up on columns of mud on the boundary of the farm, exactly to the north, south, east and west from the Agnihotra hut. You can also install them under a small uh, simple structure to protect them from bad weather. Here's a layout of a typical homer farm. Uh, you can see one hut for Agni Hotra in the center, another hut nearer to the entrance for Om Tramakam Homa, and the four resonance columns on the boundary, each with their own pyramid. Here's an interesting graphic showing what, it, what uh, is possible when several farmers cooperate together in one resonance point. Here we can see maybe 20 farms in an area of about 150 acres and they're all cooperating together, it means they're all organic. They all help to participate with the Agni Hotra fire and the Om Kamakam fire. And of course, when you have 20 families available for that work, it becomes extremely manageable. The results uh, result in a sharing of the labor and the cost between all the farms. So, what the farmer has to do. Daily, Agni Hotra at sunrise and sunset, and up to four hours of Om Trambakam Homa. 
the farmer or the farmers, the group of farmers and their families. On the full moon and the new moon days, twice in a month that is, Agni Hotra at sunrise and sunset, and up to 24 hours continuous of Om Kambakam Homa. Here's an interesting graphic uh, which refers to uh, the importance of the cow and the importance of uh, the products of the cow in maintaining Homa. First of all, if we start at the top, if we have regular practice of Homa, this leads to nutritious and timely rains, which lead to abundant and healthy crops, and man, his animals uh, become happy and healthy. In particular, the cows give plentiful supplies of high quality cow dung and ghee for the Homa, and so on, the cycle continues. Now, in terms of modern science, modern Western science, when we speak of agriculture, modern science uh, is only really interested in soil analysis and water analysis a little, but it does not talk about the atmosphere. According to the ancient science of homotherapy, more than 75% of nutrition, the plants and soil, comes through the atmosphere. So if you make the atmosphere more nutritious by using HOMA, a type of protective coating comes on the plants and diseases, fungi, pests, etc., do not thrive. And the plant's capacity to breathe also increases and the toxic effect of choking to death due to atmospheric toxins is eliminated. So these are the benefits of home organic farming. First of all, the quantity of the harvest per acre will be greater than that grown by any other method known to modern science. Harvesting time is reduced. The taste of homer produce is better. There is improvement in color and texture of the harvest. Homer produce has a longer shelf life than that grown by any known method. Natural predators appear automatically. Disease resistance increases and the cost of production is much less compared with other methods. Now the cow is a very, very special creature and has a very special uh, role to play in homo organic farming. The cow dung and the cow's ghee are essential ingredients of all homophiles. Cow dung and cow urine are used for treating the seeds before planting. They are also necessary components for organic composts, such as vermicompost, and also for bio biofertilizers, such as biosol, homo biosol. Honeybees are also very important and they're dying now on a mass scale in all parts of the world. So this is actually a big threat to agricultural production. But the ancient wisdom states that inborn in the honeybee, there are certain hormones that are produced solely in homo atmosphere. So this subject is foreign to anything science has encountered so far in this respect. And these hormones in the bees help nutritional levels in the uh, uh, plants and vegetables, fruits and vegetables, to yield at much more increased rates. Then earthworms are also uh, affected by the uh, Agni Hotra and the Homa. In fact, their reproductive organs get activated and uh, they uh, reproduce prolifically. And uh, this uh, is a great boon to the soil. The, the earthworms, of course, are vital for uh, agriculture. Here we can see some earthworms in Spain, in Homa Farm in Spain. They look like small snakes. So let me just now briefly tell you some things from the scientific side of things about Homa organic farming. These are some experiments which have been done at several agricultural universities in India. The first instance uh, concerns um, a friend of ours from Tamil Nadu. He's at the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University in Uti. He's retired now, Dr. Savaraj. And uh, he did some experiments with Agnihotra and uh, on uh, various uh, plants, including cabbage, potato, and flowers such as rose, carnation, and gerbera. I've given a few examples here 
of the results that he found. In these particular results, the result with Agni Hotra is highlighted in red. So four treatments were used. First of all, there was conventional chemical treatment, then was an absolute control where nothing was added at all. The third case was with organic inputs, and the last case was organic plus Agni Hotra. And you can see in each of these slides, the organic plus Agni Hotra gave the best result. Here in this case, with the case of cabbage, the yield was maximum and the percentage of disease incidence was the least. And then we have a similar situation with potato. You can see that the yield was greatest with the Agni Hotra plus uh, organic and the late blight disease in the potato was minimum with the Agni Hotra and organic. And then uh, there's another slide here about the rose, uh, rose flowers. And again, you can see that in each case, organic plus Agni Hotra gave the best results of all the, all the treatments. There's one more slide here showing uh, the incidence of powdery mildew disease. And you can see with organic and Agni Hotra, uh, only 2.9, it was the minimum of all the treatments. Then we have uh, another set of experiments which were performed in Palampur in Himachal Pradesh uh, by a, a group of scientists, uh, Dr. Meshwar, Dr. Poonam, Dr. Atul. And uh, in this particular case, they compared uh, various organic fertilizers in the production of lemongrass. They, they noticed that the yield increased, oil content also increased, and that these disease resistance also increased. Sorry, that's the lemongrass slide there. I, I forgot to uh, change it. Now, here are the um, data, the results from that particular, uh, again, you can see in red, I've highlighted the uh, Agni Hotra section, and you can see in each particular case, the best results were obtained using organic manure, that means OM, or OM organic manure plus the Agni Hotra ash. In each case, the best results in red. And then uh, there were four uh, MSC theses produced in uh, Darwood University of Agricultural Science uh, in Karnataka uh, a few years earlier. Uh, this were under the guidance of uh, the um, head of the uh, uh, head of one of the departments there, um, biochemistry, I think it was, uh, Dr. Pramod Basaka, and uh, the plant study were tomato, cabbage, soybean, and okra. And in each case, the parameters which were studied showed a better yield less of pests and diseases and better quality in the nutrient content. So, uh, first of all, there were 10 treatments, different treatment methods uh, they used in this particular uh, set of uh, trials for the theses. And uh, the T4 treatment uh, was the one which was most important for us. That's the seed treatment with Agnihotra ash. Uh, fresh cow dung and cow urine followed by soil application with homobiosol after 30, 45 and 60 days. And then here are uh, a summary, a summary slide showing the results. Uh, and you can see that uh, in each case, in each one of those particular studies in each crop, the increase which was shown with uh, in, including by including the Agni Hotra Homa. In each particular case, there was an increase in the particular uh, parameters which they measured. And then uh, another slide showing some uh, various summaries of that, uh, those particular theses. In the tomatoes, we had a decrease in the incidence of leaf spot and insect attack. And in cabbage, the decrease in the incidence of black rot and black spot of leaf. 
head borer and the number of diamond-backed moth larvae per plant and also the Spodoptera litura larvae per plant, also all decreased. In the case of the uh, soybean, there was a decrease in instance of rust disease and also insect attack. And in the case of okra, disease incidence of powdery mildew was reduced. And also the same with Alternaria leaf spot, fruit borer and Spodoptera litura, they all were uh, uh, decreased in the case of the okra. okra. Uh, uh, study as well. And then uh, the, another one particular slide here about the soybeans. We can see in that particular case it was a 5% increase in protein content, 9.5% increase in oil content, and enzymes also were increased. Beta amylase was increased by 35%, and after germination, this increase went up to 66%. Invertase enzyme was increased by 45% and after germination this increase went up to 100%. So you can see from these uh, the data that something fantastic happens uh, with the um, with the uh, Agnihotra and the Homa farming in terms of these scientific results. There's another one here uh, on, of cabbage. Uh, I mean you can uh, you can ask me I'll give you these uh, slides if you want and you can study them in great detail. But basically, they're all saying the same thing. There's a very, very much improvement in all the parameters when you use the Agnihotra and the uh, homotherapy in the homo farming. In tomato, same thing applies. Now, I just want to now uh, give, give you some examples of different homo farms in different parts of the world. Uh, here's a, a farm of my friend, uh, friends Lee and Fritz Ringmar from Australia. Uh, Ulrich mentioned this particular farm yesterday in terms of the great result they had with uh, uh, reduction of the pH uh, in their bore well, which they uh, recently dug. But there's another story from their farm also, which is even more unbelievable. Uh, Lee and Fritz tell us that once there was a water diviner, a dowser, who visited their farm. After walking the farm, he told us that the underground water was acting in a very unusual way. He said it traveled along its natural course and then suddenly made a sharp 90 degree turn, proceeded under the Agnihotra hut and continued in the same direction for some time until it turned back on itself towards the original course. The point where it turned back to itself was exactly under uh, a particular building inside which they had dug their bore well. It wasn't noticeable to the public that there was a bore well inside that uh, particular building. And you can see in the next slide basically what that looks like. This is, um, this is their land, and uh, that shows the water course and the position of the bore well and the Agnihotra hut. And then in the next slide, we can see what exactly happened to that water. You can see at some point, it turns away from its course towards the Agnihotra hut, continues under the Agnihotra hut up to this uh, farm shed and then returns to the main water course. Now that's something just unbelievable. It's totally <laughs> unnatural. You, you can't expect to see that in nature. It's all there. Something has happened there. Something has happened. Something has uh, been created by the Agnihotra to pull that water off its course and to the newly uh, established bore well. It's, uh, to me, that's just an absolutely miraculous thing, which I, I just can't, uh, can't really explain how amazing that is. Now, let me continue with some more stories. Uh, with the various homer farms and the results which were achieved. Here's a story of soya bean. 
my friend and uh, colleague, Mrs. Karen. She was staying on this uh, soybean farm near Indoor in MP uh, in the year 2000, 2001. Um, the yield of the soybeans were very poor. And so the owner of the farm decided to go for Homer farming to see if they could increase the yield. The yield increased to an unbelievable quantity from 350 kilos in the 2000, uh, 2000 season, it increased to 2,105 kilos per hectare in the 2001 season. The nearest result was 1,200 kilos per hectare. The, the crop was also of superior color. Uh, the roots of the plants also showed twice the number of nitrogen fixing nodules as on the surrounding farms. So, We've got another uh, example here from um, this time from Karnataka. Uh, uh, our good friend uh, <coughs> Sri Abhay Mutalik Desai. Uh, he started uh, Homa farming in 1999, and um, at some point uh, he was growing vanilla on his farm. And when he had the vanilla tested, at the uh, Central Food Technolog uh, Technological Research Institute in Mysore, it tested at a figure of 36% by weight of vanilla content. That was the best, uh, the best result they had that year. It was w w far and away the best commercial result. The normally commercial result of vanilla uh, by that CO2 extraction method is around 25%, sometimes getting up to 28%. So 36% was an incredible result for that vanilla crop. Then the same guy also grows sugarcane on his farm. In 2005, the sugarcane was attacked by woolly aphids. And uh, what happened was that immediately that uh, predator was, uh, that, uh, that insect was attacked by two natural predators called Micromoths and Dipha aphidibora, which came automatically. He later, uh, uh, yeah, later uh, found out that the reason for that was because of impure ghee, which he was using for the Agnihotra and the Homas. And uh, he said, interesting also, that the predators started from the same place where the woolly aphids had first appeared. Now the sugarcane is wonderful, green and lush. Then there's another story here from um, uh, South India. Bangalore from the uh, Art of Living campus. Uh, they had coconuts on their uh, farm, on their land, uh, which were at, in the 2004 season attacked by um, uh, a, a leaf eating caterpillar called Nephantis serenopa. The one uh, agricultural officer who was the assistant director of agriculture in Kasrago district in Kerala came to investigate the crop and he recommended they, they should immediately cut all the leaves and burn them. Uh, he, he, left the, he left the campus and then the next day, the youth leadership team started at Hotra on the campus. When he, uh, this uh, agricultural guy, uh, Sri PJ Joseph returned three days later, he could find no evidence of this leaf eating caterpillar on any of the coconuts. He opened cocoons to see and nothing was there. So he recommended them immediately to stop cutting the leaves and uh, he certified mm -hmm. that the coconut garden was completely free from that leaf eating caterpillar. Then uh, uh, time is getting short now. Uh, I quickly go through a few more of these uh, slides. Um, I've got some uh, slides from uh, various other countries as well, uh, because I want to leave some time at the end for questions. There's um, a, a slide about uh, tea plantation in Tamil Nadu. Uh, again, I, if anybody's interested, I can give you these details so you can go through them and see them yourself. There's a story about uh, various stone fruits from uh, Himachal Pradesh. Um, 
This is a, a very interesting story from uh, UP, Uttar Pradesh, in Unnao district. Uh, there was one mango farmer there who got an incredible result uh, on the, in the 2010 season. Uh, his result in that particular year was 40 tons per hectare of mangoes. And if anybody knows details about mango, mango production, the average is around 10 tons per hectare. Uh, it can be extended up to 14 to 16 tons with a bit of luck. Uh, I think nobody has yet achieved 20 tons per hectare. And this particular guy, Mr. Ramesh Chandra Tuari, he got 40 tons per hectare in the 2010 no, season. Also, Bruce, please unmute yourself. Oh, uh, sorry. Was I uh, muted, was I? Yes. Hello. Now we can hear you. Can you please go, guys. <laughs> sorry for that. Oh, okay. So this uh, one story here from Nasik district, uh, this uh, fellow, he uh, decided to try homo organic farming on a small section of his farm. He simply sprayed water with Agnihotra ash twice a week. And what he discovered was that on the four lanes which he selected, there was absolutely no disease. But the other 20 lanes where he used chemicals were uh, subject to the same diseases and pests which he had uh, in the past. So he's very, very happy and convinced about Agnihotra and Homo farming. And now he wants to convert his whole farm to Homo technology. Here are some stories now from other countries. This particular story, uh, I think we saw yesterday in Dr. Ulrich's presentation, that's about the uh, radioactivity on the Homo farm in Austria. That's also absolutely miraculous. Um, in the 1990s, there was uh, a severe outbreak of disease, fungus disease in the banana and plantain uh, plantations of Central and South America. And there's uh, one story here from uh, Panama in Central America, where uh, after 60 days of homotherapy treatment, the uh, fungus disease called, called black cigatoka was completely controlled. Uh, and uh, according to the farmer there, he estimates that there was 70% improvement in his uh, plantation of bananas after two months of treatment only. Then another story here also from, this is from South America, from Peru in South America. This concerns cocoa. Uh, there was a 25-year-old cocoa plantation which was completely abandoned because it was full of uh, moniliasis disease, witch's broom, phytophthora, moss and other parasitic plants, leaf-cutting ants, and pernicious weeds. The plantation was in an emergency situation. You can see the photo of the cocoa pods there, totally diseased. After three months only of homotherapy treatment, there was a complete rejuvenation in the whole of the plantation. No diseases, no pest attack. The moss and other parasitic plants dried up. Vigorous growth, abundant, healthy, holy, big, healthy fruits, and harvest after every 10 days. So another fantastic result there. And then in 1999, we had a story from Peru again in South America about an incredible project which took place on an area of 3,000 acres at a time. That, uh, that 3,000 acres was divided into 30 modules, each of 100 acres. Each one was a resonance point, 100 acre resonance point. And for seven months, the agricultural officers from the office of the Presidency of the Republic of Peru monitored 
all the crops which were grown in that area, including plantains, bananas, papaya, cocoa, citrus, avocado, coffee, tea, star fruit, mango, and also annual crops such as rice, corn, soybean, nuts, sesame, etc., and also complemented with honeybees and cattle. They noted there was substantial reduction of all pathogenic agents, all pests and diseases were completely eradicated. The yield of the harvest was increased. The fruit grew healthy with better color, better taste, better weight and better texture. So that was a remarkable result uh, from Peru. I'll quickly go through a few more of these because time is really getting short now. Um, here we can see a story from uh, Peru, part of that particular you can see the taste with the uh, papayas, production of 75 metric tons, uh, with conventional agriculture increased to 150 metric tons using homo farming. Then another case was coffee, also in Peru, the same, uh, same project. Uh, here, uh, that particular engineer, Rosa Cortez Morales, uh, she uh, reported that the plantation, the plantation started to flower at eight months and in its sec full second fruition after 14 months. Normally coffee yields the first flowers, uh, first fruits after only 18 months. So very, very, very uh, quick uh, 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 these, uh, with the homo farming, quick results coming. Then there's another story here from Mango. Uh, this is also in Peru. And you can see the farm in the year uh, 1998 was severely damaged by uh, climatic changes, um, climatic disaster, they call that. By 2001, the farm was in a critical condition. They started homotherapy on the farm in 2001. And you can see the increase in production on the right-hand side in each year. The uh, production uh, is increasing. Uh, so. Uh, at that point, uh, after that 2007, unfortunately, that guy uh, passed away and they sold that farm. But uh, you can see it's incredible, the uh, results coming with this homo farming. Another story here comes from Ecuador in South America, from a banana farm. And uh, you can see that um, after 2008, they started the homo farming technology and 2008, it, it, the purple, the purple uh, uh, lines on the graph at the top, you can see that uh, the maximum production there came uh, at that particular time after they started agnihotra and homa farming. There's another slide from the same farm. And uh, that particular guy reports that his farm became the number one farm uh, in productivity of all the banana plantations in the area due to the use of the HOMA technology. Another quick story here is from uh, Australia. This guy is growing broccoli, very, very uh, exotic vegetable. And uh, he got Please, please. 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 So that was also a very, very impressive result from Australia. Coffee in Colombia. Colombia also in South America. This particular lady also had a wonderful result with her coffee plantation in Colombia. I'm moving quickly now uh, because time is very shorter. We've only got uh, four minutes remaining till eight o'clock. Um, Agni Otra and Homa Farming also uh, are, uh, uh, have a great effect on the animals. Uh, in particular, the cattle, which are, are integral to homo farms. And what's very interesting is that uh, in some studies, they discovered that the uh, retention of placenta at the time of uh, delivery of the baby cow is um, uh, reduced to uh, absolutely zero. Normally, retaining the placenta is a problem uh, for cows. But uh, with homo farming, that is reduced to absolutely zero. So this is much uh, important for the health of the cows. 
Now, I just want to briefly talk about the economic logic of homo farming. It's a slide which shows the profit and loss compared, uh, comparing homo farming with agrochemicals. This is uh, uh, in a soybean, uh, uh, soybean uh, farm. Uh, you can see the profit for the homotherapy farm was 316%, the bottom line, compared with a 72% loss with the agricultural chemicals. And here, another slide shows the same thing with cotton in South America. And you can see uh, in this particular case with homotherapy, we got a 106% profit. And with the agrochemicals, it was only a 32% profit. So, what I want to uh, impress onto you today is that this homo organic farming is a wonderful solution to so many of our problems, especially the agricultural problems. And if we go for large scale implementation of homo farming, then I think we'll see a complete revolution in the agricultural sector economy in India. This will result in a win-win situation for not only the banks, but the farmers and society in general. The long-term end result, total eradication of poverty. That's my view. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, I'd like to now uh, hand over to uh, Krupa again. And if anybody has got uh, one or two questions about that, I'd be happy to answer any questions if I can.